Lots of things in our universe are mathematically describable. This isn't a good indication of the conflicts between science and religious belief. The biblical description of creation is very minimal. A hundred words, I think, Genesis mm -hmm. 1 in Hebrew, something like that. Alice O'Connor recently did a very commendable job of interviewing a Christian intellectual in a respectful, gracious, and interesting way, which is always refreshing, of course, and there's a lot of gold in the discussion. It was also over an hour and a half long, so we can highlight and summarize some of the important points here at One Life Network. I'm Brett, by the way, and I've been a pastor a long long time, and during that long time, I've never seen pop culture talking about matters of faith and worldview like it is now, which I think is a huge positive. And we want to engage in those conversations. And if you do too, please hit like and subscribe. It does help us out. And now, O'Connor is interviewing an 81-year-old John Lennox, who, among other things, has three PhDs in the field of mathematics, and he's a professor of mathematics at Oxford University. Keep that in mind as you kind of listen to him think and process. Watch this. Using Galileo as an example, mm -hmm. doesn't work because if you look at what actually happened, the first people to criticize Galileo was not the Catholic Church. It was the philosophers mm. who were building on Aristotle and believed in a fixed earth. And the church got involved rather foolishly because it had climbed on the Aristotelian bandwagon. Yes. So you could argue that this is not really science versus Christianity because Galileo was a Christian. He believed yes. in God before he started all this and uh, when he finished. So I think I would agree with the historians of science that say that the Galileo incident is not really one to be used mm. uh, to show that there's a huge conflict between science and, and, and religion. Yes. I think uh, the book Galileo's Daughter is well worth reading on, on this store. And, and Galileo was a bit silly, you know, yeah. and unwise in what he did. He... <laughs> <laughs> he insisted, first of all, on writing in Italian, and that argued the that irritated the experts who thought everything should be done in Latin. Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, he uh, wrote a text and put the views of the then Pope, who had been his friend, into the mouth of a character he named Simplicio yes. the Fool. <laughs> and uh, as for... That was a great move, right? You, you, uh, you know, I, I didn't know that quite honestly that he put uh, he put the language of the fool in the in the mouth of the Pope, which probably yeah, and, and had been his friend. So would like to have been in those conversations. He are, I think he comes fairly near a zero. Yeah, actually, I, and he'd been told by the Catholic Church not to write about heliocentrism. But there was some dispute over what he was allowed to do. And so he writes this philosophical dialogue where he's like, well, I, I'm not writing an essay in favor That's of heliocentrism. Correct. I'm writing a dialogue. It's just that the character that disagrees with me is called the fool. And that's what finally did it, it seems, for the for the church. For me, I, I think you're right to say that this isn't a good indication of the conflicts between science and religious belief. For me, at best, with the most sort of uncharitable view of the Catholic practice here, it might show a, a conflict between, say, the scientific method of Galileo and the Catholic Church. But I want to very carefully tease apart the historical question of like world religions and their potential suppression of, scientific, of the scientific method with the more specific point I think you're making, which is about the personal belief in an ordered universe as being necessary to engage yeah, in science. I, I, I think that's fair enough. And if you look at various times in church history, I would say that to their shame, mm. and uh, as of the Galileo case, it was only in my lifetime that the Catholic Church rehabilitated Galileo. Yes. Uh, and that's pr pretty shameful. Finally said that he was correct. Me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've 
all respect to my Catholic friends, but I, I have noticed that a little bit. It, there is a tendency to, uh, when they apologize for things, it's usually like two or three hundred years later, uh, which is an interesting thing. But the, the entire thing that they get into here is the question of, has is there truly this um, this conflict between religion and, uh, and science? And, and the, the answer comes down to, uh, yes, there has been, but it's not a philosophical thing. A lot of times it's a belief thing. It's a, it's a personal thing, even in, in the case of Galileo and things of that nature, because um, the, 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 the fact of the matter is, is that science itself, and we talked about this on the channel, that science itself was born out of Western Europe. It was born in that culture. And they talk about the the uh, the question has been raised, which is a very good question. Uh, why, didn't, why wasn't it born out of the Chinese culture? Why wasn't it born in the Egyptian culture? They're brilliant people, brilliant ideas, but there's certain root system ideas that you needed to have in order for science to reach the place that it has with us with the scientific method and that things of that nature. So they go on to talk a little bit uh, about that here in a second. Look at this. And the same is true, I suppose, of the so-called conflict between Huxley and Wilberforce, you know, after Darwin. Yes. That these again, are... that's represented as a this is a debate that happens just down the road at the Natural just History Museum the here, the Natural History in Oxford, Museum. and it's between Thomas Huxley, who is a sort of protege of Charles Darwin. Yes, and so the the newly uh, the newly discovered idea of natural selection mm -hmm. is being defended by Huxley, and then you've got the Bishop Wilberforce who is arguing against it, and this is again seen as archetypal science, evolution, undeniable fact versus the yeah that's right the priest but it's that very can't interesting. accept it. i've read the whole debate uh -huh. and i find that many people haven't mm. and <laughs> did you hear that okay because what they're going after there's popular perceptions of how things have gone uh what r history even looks like or how situations were and even this debate how many people have actually read that debate he may be the only one uh living right now that actually did i found that with uh, origin of species i didn't read the entire thing i read as much as i possibly could before i just couldn't stand the tedium anymore but most people have not read it. And when you do go back and you read these things in their original context, there's a lot more at play uh, than we give a credit for. And we need to show an intellectual integrity in those things. <laughs> Wilberforce was the kind of cleric who was an amateur scientist. Mm -hmm. And uh, he seemed to have a lot of leisure for doing that, which might tell us something about the church in those days. Right. And Huxley was dead against this. He wanted a professional class of scientists. That's mm -hmm. the first. There was a strong bias against it. But when it came to the argument, I was fascinated to discover that very early on in his speech, Wilberforce said, I am not going to use religious arguments. Mm. I am only going to discuss the science. That's often left completely out of the discussion. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, it was, oh, what was his name, the professor of the history of science at the Open University said that this event should not be used to drive a wedge between science and Christianity. It was a much more complex thing. It was a sociological thing as well, yeah. the push to have professional scientists get rid of the clerics, turn the churches into temples to Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, and all this kind of stuff. There was much more going on than simply dealing with science. But poor old Wilberforce, I think he gets the rough end of the stick, and it's not always very yeah. accurate. Well, and, and that's one of the things that we need to keep in mind. We're exploring these things intellectually, especially in our modern age. It, it, uh, it, it does, you know, challenge us to have intellectual integrity. And I, and I like to talk about this because uh, if you're going to address issues, you really kind of want to know what was really truly going on. I, I got to sit across, for instance, from a, uh, from a scholar who had spent his entire life in the world of the study of the Crusades. And what, what struck me is that his view of them was completely, absolutely, almost the opposite of what our popular culture says they were. And he said that's true inside that very, very small world of studying the Crusades. Point being that sometimes we let pop culture assumptions inform uh, our outlook on subject matter like this, and we really shouldn't do that. Here's another thing that he gets into. There was an input from outside the system, yep. an intelligent input from you and me mm -hmm. as uh, 
the scientists involved. Now, from the biblical point of view, and this has always interested me, the biblical description of creation is very minimal. It's a hundred words, I think, Genesis mm -hmm. 1 in Hebrew, something like that. But what is emphasized in that description has always fascinated me because several times over you read, and God said, and God said. So these various stages, the days of Genesis, whatever you make of them, these stages are each introduced by God speaking. Now, again, the New Testament says very little about the how of creation, mm -hmm. but it does say something. Mm. And it says something very profound to my mind, and that is, in the beginning was the, the word. word. That is, the word already was. And this is an existence statement, because it then goes on to say, through the word, all, all things, things were created. came to be is actually what the Greek says. Yes, okay. It's fascinating. So the word already was, the word never came to be. The world came to be, you and I came to be. Mm -hmm. And then of course there comes the huge statement which shows John's fascination by existence. And the word came to be human or came to be flesh. Mm -hmm. God became human, which is a central Christian claim. But sticking at the creation level, my reaction to that is, this is a word-based creation. Now, on here, we talk about that all the time, because I think that is one of the most profound realities there is, that where the Bible matches up with reality, the universe and everything else, is that communication is the centerpiece of the universe, according to the Bible, and they're discovering more and more um, in the universe itself. How do we see any evidence of that? I believe we do. First of all, in the fact that lots of things in our universe are mathematically describable. That is, we can use the language of mathematics to describe them. Mm -hmm. And that is so amazing mm -hmm. that really clever people like Einstein saw that there was a problem. And you remember the famous thing he said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. Yes. He could see that there was something absolutely amazing that someone thinking here could come up with equations that described what's going on out there. So a word-based universe at that level. But then, much later than Einstein, we discover that in biology, life is a word-based phenomenon as well. An information bearing macromolecule, DNA. So at the heart of the two sides, physics and biology, it's word-based. Word and that resonates very much with me. In the beginning was the word. Hmm. And I remember, this will amuse you, years ago I, I was working in Cardiff and next to me, or almost next to me, was Professor Chandra Wickrama Singh. I don't know whether you've heard of him. He was an astro, is an astro. Who hasn't, right? physicist and worked a great deal with Fred Hoyle. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about this one day and he, he, he'd been in America and he would got into one of these so-called creation trials. And he said, it's such a pity. He said, uh, the people in America, the Christians were very nice, but they're so hopelessly naive. They believe the Bible. And I felt I had to defend my Christian brothers and sisters mm. in spite of how extreme their views might be. And I said, well, actually, I believe the Bible in the sense that I take it very seriously because, of course, it's full of metaphor and all this kind of thing. And he said, prove it to me. So I walked over to the board. I'll never forget this. He threw me a piece of chalk and I had to prove it to him. So I wrote, and God said, let there be light. Mm. So Chandra roared his head off. And he said, there you go. You're as naive as the rest of them. <laughs> Do you think God is a voice box in lungs like they have? And I said, Chandra, now you're being naive. This is very simple language. But if you don't mind, let me put it in different language. So underneath this, I wrote, 
in the beginning was the Word. And he said, what does that mean? And I went on, and all things came to be through the Word. Well, I said, Word, speech, information. And he stopped me at that point. He said, what did you say? I said, I said, information. You heard me. He said, are you meaning to imply that this biblical text somehow refers to the concept of information? I said, it looks like. And then he said, does Fred Hoyle know about this? Hmm. I said, I don't know. So he told him. He arranged a meeting where we had a long discussion with Fred Hoyle before he died, and I remember that so very well. So at the middle of the universe, it's conceptually uh, able to be understood because it, it, it mathematics is connected to it in our minds. And then also when we look at biology, it works on language. Language is everywhere, and the Bible says in advance, pretty much, in Genesis says, and God said, and in the beginning of John, it says, in the beginning was the Logos. And we talk about that a lot here because that I, I think that's the centerpiece of most reason why we would believe. It's at least a first-place evidence. The nature of reality itself is communication-based, word-based, meaning-based, and that gives, that gives credibility to our consciousness to our, our, our outlook on life, even morals. It goes on and on and on and on and on. Uh, John Lennox is a brilliant guy. I would encourage you to watch the entire talk, and we've actually uh, uh, used him before. If you look at this video where he uh, uh, he did a formal debate where they are, what's called the Oxford Union, and uh, he debated, uh, and they get Richard Dawkins' reaction on there. But I, I would encourage you just to kind of explore this whole idea of communication being at the centerpiece of the universe and use that as at least a starting place as as evidence, because I've seen in the comments people say things like, well, still, there's no evidence. By the way, that is evidence, as evidence is defined. So look at it that way. It's not proof, and they talk about there's a difference between proof and evidence, but evidence is just a pointer to something that should give us a little bit more confidence about the truth of these kinds of things. Hope that helps. See you next time.